Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, I'm honored to have James Schrenko, who's the, one of the legends of online business strategy. James teaches people how to grow a successful online business at superfastbusiness.com, and he has grown his business to seven figures in annual profit from scratch. He introduced a hugely influential concept to the internet marketing space called Own the Race Course, which we will be talking about. He has five top-rated business podcasts in iTunes, not one, not two, five, including his most recent, salesmarketingprofit.com. James, thank you so much for joining me. Lovely to be on the show, yeah. Dr. Jeremy. Yeah, and it looks beautiful in Australia. And we're going to talk, I'm going to ask some surfing questions too. So we'll get to that. But I'm excited to hear some of your big lessons, big mistakes in your journey, what worked, what didn't work. And I always like to include a fun fact, but most people know everything about you, that you like to surf, you like to read, watch movies. One thing I discovered I thought was interesting, which I didn't know, is um, you have four kids, right? Yep. So what's the tough part about having four kids, family, and running the business from, from early on when you first started? I think the tough part is that it is a, a one-way street with no exit. Like when you, when you have kids, you realize at some point that it's usually when the kid's born that you have the next 20 years of being responsible mm -hmm. per child, which is that's a huge commitment and, and it really separates you out from those 19-year-old um, guys you see online who are working 20 hours a day, sleeping in sleeping bags at their desk uh, and then partying and you know, living a different sort of a lifestyle than, than a responsible parent because yeah. with traditional parenting, you have to, you know, schooling, clothing, housing, cars, furniture, it's just like you need a lot of money, basically. A lot of expenses. And it's huge. If the kid, they reckon the kid, each kid costs you like X million dollars <laughs> over their lifetime. I'd have to say that the responsibility is a big factor and that's yeah. what being a parent yeah. will bring to the table. And they, they also say when you have kids, you become a kid to your parents. And I think that's definitely true. I, I realize what my parents did for me with all those nappies and, uh, and food and stuff that you can tend to take for granted yeah. until you start having kids. Yeah. And you obviously took, you know, you took the path. Um, we'll get into some of the, the sales positions you have, but the entrepreneur journey, what kind of uh, values or things do you try and instill in your kids now when they're young? Well, I just want them to think mm -hmm. and to follow their bliss mm -hmm. uh, and not get hoodwinked by traditional systematic thinking. Right. Uh, so they, they're into quite interesting things, each of them, they're all separate. Uh, everything from rock, get, you know, rock, one of them's a rock star, mm -hmm. and the other, other one's a, a show jumper for horses, and then another one builds programs, and, and the other one's like a gaming specialist. So they're, they're all different, but mm -hmm. they're pursuing their, uh, their strong, unique skills. Yeah. I'm jumping to the bottom because I, I, when I asked about what your best advice is, and you did say think, um, one of the things you said was think. What do you do to help get them think to think? Ask questions. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so just rather than accept everything, mm -hmm. just think, uh, just ask questions about it. Why is, why is this the way it is? What, what are my options here? What else could I do? Mm -hmm. Why does, what is someone's motivation for me to do something? You know, what, what is a bank's motivation when they're talking to me about a mortgage? Right. I imagine they probably want to make a profit for their shareholders. Mm -hmm. so is that in my best interest? Not necessarily. Right. Do I have other options? Yes. Yeah. So I have them thinking on a whole different level and, and I do the same with my team and I, mm -hmm. I, hopefully I do it with myself. <laughs> you know, I'm always asking questions. Uh, it, it breaks down to the, the next extrapolation of think is to question everything. Just don't, don't accept what you've been told when you grew up because a lot of it's probably not true mm -hmm. or, or harmful to your success. Yeah, yeah, very true. So some of your big lessons, you named a few, but I want to get into kind of where you started and what influenced you early on. But first, talk about some of the big lessons that you've learned in your career. Well, one of them is uh, the, to, to play a much longer game. It's a long game. Like 
I've not, luckily I've had a career now of several decades, and I see people come into a, a market and then exit fairly swiftly because they're playing a short game. Mm-hmm. You know, some people play as, as short a game as I'll get my get rich quick link today and then start spamming all my friends on Facebook with it. No, that's a very short game. Mm-hmm. I prefer to build a, a, a machine or a system that lasts a lot longer. Mm-hmm. And uh, I pr- pretty much learned that through having a fairly slow sales cycle working with Mercedes-Benz mm-hmm. of you know a year to two years. I think, I think 22 months is the average buying cycle oh, wow. of a Mercedes-Benz owner. So you don't have to wait a couple of years until you can re- sell that customer right. uh, but also I, I realized the value of recurring income that's been one of the most important lessons ever sell once get paid over and over again mm-hmm. and I've built my whole business around the, these two concepts and I help customers build the same thing and it's ama- amazing to see the transformation when someone goes from desperate for the next meal through to having the next wave of income lined up for months on end Mm -hmm. that's automatically going to appear and then they can relax a bit and focus on the longer game and build something worthwhile. That seems obvious, obviously, but but when did you first discover that? Because sometimes we know it, but we don't implement it. Well, I I guess I researched a fair bit about subscription models, uh, Mm -hmm. but I noticed that I was paying things on subscription, you know, like a phone bill or a... um, magazine subscription you know I, I agree once and then the magazines turn up each month in my letterbox and I think well oh, that's a pretty good model and when I was an affiliate I started off having great success selling one particular product and it was a one-time sale and at one point I, I switched to a recurring sale and suddenly my income started to snowball with no less effort and no more effort the same effort but um, this compounding Kept effect building. of having income and I still get checks now from stuff I was doing seven years ago wow. you know like every single month I get checks for several hundred dollars from some of the original programs I promoted that that have got people on a massive lock-in like an autoresponder service for example where people generally don't leave mm, right yeah and then you I talked about in the front of the interview about the race course tell us about that so i I really had this drummed into me by one mentor in particular and and the whole concept was control and no compromise and uh, basically the idea of own the race course is you want to own your own asset and if you're the owner of the race course, it doesn't matter which horse wins or loses the race, the owner of the race course still gets the racing fee. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if the bookie makes money or loses money, the owner of the race course is still getting rent. It doesn't matter if the food shop you know, sells out of stock or can't make back their rent, but the owner of the race course gets the rent. Like, you basically, you always get paid and you control everything and you set the rules. And in uh, things like Facebook, I see a, uh, a lot of business owners making the simple mistake, the obvious mistake, of putting all their best content there and thinking, well, that's my presence, that's my website, that's where I'm going to set up shop. And, and to some extent, they do the same on YouTube. The problem is when they change the rules. Right. And then you start getting all this, oh, it's unfair. It's unfair because Facebook don't like my industry now. Or Facebook closed my page. Or first, Facebook shut down my group. Or yeah. people are scraping all the user profiles of my members and marketing to them with ads. Well, if you play on someone else's race course, you have right. to abide by their rules. So right. uh, important to set up on your own platform and then use those other platforms to leverage your platform but I, I think this has been a fundamental shift in thinking and if you do go to the extra effort and it does require effort in the beginning yeah. to set up your base and then use the other sites to leverage your base like use iTunes to leverage your podcast but have your content and your transcription and your email list at your base you're going to have an asset that's saleable and you have a lot more control of your destiny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what do you, and, and you also uh, wrote about your chocolate wheel. What's that? So this is something I learned from the Mercedes-Benz dealership and that is, it's all about your product lineup and packaging. And a lot of people have uh, fallen for this furphy of 
the ascension model. And the ascension model is this old way of thinking that's flawed because it says, well, you should have free and then a low price product and then a middle price product, perhaps recurring, and then a high price product. And that's how you should move customers through mm -hmm. and they ascend. Right. Uh, but that's a load of bullshit. And here's why. And there's customers out there who today would like the top product that you offer. Like right. right now, they don't need to go through that whole rigmarole. And basically, that is um, talking past the sale. If you push people through a funnel that they don't want to go through and they're mm. ready for the top product, yeah. you're actually compromising your income. So what I observed at the car dealership is we'd have some people coming in to buy a new car. We'd have some people coming in for a service. We'd have some people buying parts yeah. for an older car. We'd have some people financing their new car or refinancing their old car when the lease runs out. And what happened was there'd be a lot of cross flow between the departments. And I realized, well, hey, our business is made up of all these different divisions, but it's one business. And within all of those divisions, it doesn't matter where someone comes in, but they can experience every single part of this chocolate wheel. So if someone comes in for one thing, like a petrol cap to replace a broken one on their car, they might end up buying a new car. Or if they come in for a service, we could do a valuation and sell a new car. Or if they come in for a new car, then we'll advise them to come and service the car at the dealership. So I do the same with my business. And so I create slices of the chocolate wheel that complement each other, dealing with the same customer. So my one customer, and Own the Race Course is the best example of this, my one customer could get a free course on how to control their asset. They could join my community where they can learn how to really leverage their online business so they can join super fast business. They could then buy a website template uh, which we sell, which is the Own the Race Course template, which gets them my highest converting website template from scratch. So they're now dealing with my services division. And then when that's all kicking butt and they're making 10 grand a month, then they qualify for my mastermind and they can join that too. So in theory, and as it turns out in practice, someone can actually experience every part of my business and that means more dollar value per customer for me. It means a lot less effort for marketing because I'm now just cross-selling rather than finding cold leads. And if you consider that 92% of my business is recurring, then uh, I could have multiple recurring income streams from one customer and they're only doing it because they're getting value and they're far better off for it. So everyone's happy. Yeah, yeah. How do you structure it so that you're not ascending them through free small item? What do you do with, do you do something with the email list or structure the website so that you make sure, I guess, you get the right person to the right offer that they need? Yeah, I have a lot of focus on relevance and segmenting. So depending where someone opts in, they'll be getting broadcasts relating to that topic or interest. It could be business interest, traffic interest, or a website yeah. interest. They're the main three categories that I run. Uh, they might come through a podcasting funnel and they'll be tagged appropriately and they stay in the podcast until they get enough exposure to the other products to, to be interested. Yeah. Uh, I have behavioral segmentation. So when someone visits a checkout page and doesn't buy, then I'll start following them up for that product, just like Amazon.com. And that they're going to get broadcasts uh, with free content, which always leads them into the most appropriate relevant solution relating to whatever topic I'm covering, whether it's an interview or an infographic, uh, or if I'm just releasing some training from my paid membership as a preview. Yeah, yeah, I did notice that it's like phenomenal segmenting. When I go to your page, like I have an option of four or five things, and then you actually, you know, the customer gets what they want too. They don't have to kind of search around for you know, whatever and, and leave it to chance. You actually, that it's probably a good user experience, I would think too. It's all about user experience and not treating your customer like fools, like a lot of marketers tend to do. Uh, when they're throwing up a video player with no controls for a 50 minute sales pitch, they're really disrespecting their audience. Uh, even if it converts more now, it's not a long haul strategy. That's a short term strategy. It's what I like to call a club the baby seal strategy. Uh, so I use a product chooser and yes, you're right, someone can come to my site, from the home page they can click on the very obvious products tab, they can choose the right solution for what they're needing help with and get to the right product to buy within a couple of clicks 
with a clear explanation and at all times they've got the option to, to phone a number or to involve support mm. if they're not sure about something and then they'll get followed up if they go to a checkout and don't buy and it gives them more opportunities to ask questions or to re, uh, visit that page where they can buy. Yeah. I mean, James, you're a passionate guy. What do you see online that maybe pisses you off the most that people are doing that, that is not respecting the customer? I just think it's all this selfish push marketing, spammy sort of people don't care about the the end user, they only care about themselves and it's pretty obvious in some cases. And uh they do treat people pretty uh with an ordinary sort of approach, you know, and like not everyone's as dumb as the marketers might think they are. Yeah. And certainly there's some dumb people out there who buy the most ridiculous, you know, pie in the sky, too good to be true stuff, like that P.T. Barnum saying, like some people are victims of their own stupidity. There's no doubt about that. But the people who prey on those people, I think, yeah. are, are nasty people. Like they're not good for other humans. It'd be nice to see a little bit of a clean up, whether it's... Um, someone enforcing these ridiculous claims or, or just a way to, to siphon off the rubbish. And to a lot of, you know, to some extent, platforms like Google and Facebook do try and weed out that stuff and, and they forbid lots of, uh, lots of niches from participating in the mainstream, which they should. I mean, uh, one example, and, and, you know, I will tar the whole industry with the same brush because they deserve it, is the MLM industry. It, it's, for the most part, a dreamer's zone of get rich quick people who uh, don't want to put in the work, don't mm. want to add any value. They just want to scrape. Uh, they just want to appeal to people's greed and uh, and get rich for no particular value contribution. And I yeah. think that's why they get tarnished and they and deservedly so. Yeah, I, I think people too. They have short attention spans. They want a quick fix. How do you train your students to look more at the long haul? Well, once they see the power of my frameworks and business model, it's a very compelling uh, argument to uh, to move that direction. I, mean, I, I just share some statistics with them about my own business, and some of the interesting things are uh, like I've had probably four, maybe five years now of six-figure months of recurring income with a reasonable work week these days, uh, no launches, no affiliates. No real paid advertising, you know. It's it's a very effective business model. Yeah. It's a low pressure system, I'd call it. There's yeah. no hype. There's no risk. There's no um, super effort. It's cash flow positive from the beginning. It really helps customers more when you can deliver a solution that they're happy to continue paying for. It makes you, as the marketer, develop better solutions. Yeah. What are some of the big mistakes you see people making or that you made? Yeah, well, I try not to make too many mistakes. <laughs> so, like, I see other people make them and I won't do that. Uh, well, attaching themselves to someone else's platform, we've covered. Uh, thinking way too short term, we've covered. Not building an email list is pretty common. And, uh, you know, like if you have a... If you have a business model where you only get paid once and you only get paid now and you don't collect many details, that's probably not a, a smart business model. Mm -hmm. uh, I see people selling things they're not qualified in. It's pretty common. Like they have, they're selling dreams and, and hope and, and thin promises. And they haven't done it themselves, you mean? Yeah. It's like they picked up a course today and then they're an expert tomorrow. I, I really don't agree with fake it till you make it or the idea that Anyone can be an expert tomorrow if you just charge enough. Some of them have like incredible mantras like the only way you're going to sell a high-priced product is to buy a high-priced product, i.e. the one I'm selling you. Uh, and that way you'll know what it's like to invest in yourself and then you should be able to charge other people and they can invest in you and then you can show them how they can invest uh, in you and then they can sell other people. It's like some high-level pyramid scheme of nothingness right and and after you've burnt your rolodex then there's nothing left so it's a very flawed model yeah you said trying to learn for free is one of the ones tell me about that well it's just a slow way to go uh because you know we 
you can find stuff on the internet for free, and there's some very good information for free. And uh, you know, I publish great information for free. But it's it's uh, unless you're learning from someone who's done what you want to do, or it's, unless you're learning from someone who you can relate to and who has practical information that's really easy to action, it's going to take you a long time. Mm. I, for the most part, people are better to make a small investment and speed up their learning because the return on investment is worth it to them. The, the most valuable commodity being time and you only get 180 hours a month to work on your business, you might as well tr trade some time for, uh, for money and yeah. um, invest to speed up your results. Yeah. So what was the most important investment you made in your learning with some with the mentor? Kindle books. What are your favorites? Well, I got about 2000. So that's that's a long list. <laughs> <laughs> For someone uh, just starting out and they want a few basically anyone who's dead is usually a good starting point. <laughs> anyone who's dead? Yeah, like Drucker, Peter Drucker. Mm -hmm. um, is is a good starting point. And uh, you know he's he's very good business guy. Uh, lo lots of practical information there. Like uh, there's one book called The Daily Drucker. You could just read one thing per day mm -hmm. if you want to build up your business strategy chops. Yeah. that's a nice way to start. Yeah, James, I want to find out too. You know how you got to that point. What were some of the inspirations for you growing up? My grandparents. I think my, my grandfather taught me valuable lessons even though I didn't know it at the time. For example, when I was late to to work, I used to work for him. He used to have a timber broking business and he'd make 3% on all the orders, buying and selling timber for building companies from the timber yards and he'd just basically buy, he'd buy and sell over the phone. It's a very, very uh, phone-based job. A lot of psychology and influence and negotiation and rapport building and, and salesmanship happening there. But I turned up a few minutes late one day and he told me to piss off. I said, piss off son, you're late. And, he, and I had to argue with him for 15 minutes just to sell him on the idea that I could stay there so that I could work for the day. And he taught me some old school discipline which is very lacking in, in uh, younger generational workers. Uh, especially people who have grown up with telephones, uh, SMS and stuff. The, the attention span of of the the youth now is phenomenally low. Like they just have, they need distraction every second. And my grandfather was very old school, uh, and and taught me real disciplines that I've carried through all my jobs. I've always had more work ethic than most of the people around me. My biggest challenge was to stop working too much. Mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of people have any have struggled to do any work because they're just busy watching YouTube videos or playing games on Facebook. So, what did you do to uh, tone down your work ethic? I installed rescue time and kept a regulator on the hours that I'm working and, and where I'm spending them or you know, investing them to make sure that it's effective. And I constantly question everything. Why am I doing this? Is there someone else in my business who could do this? Is there? Is this even need to be done at all? Could I automate this with software? Uh, if I didn't do it, would it make a difference to my life? Yeah. And I know early on you did some debt collection. What lessons did you learn from that? Well, it's pretty hard selling stuff after someone has the goods and now you have to get the money. So I learned about making... Uh, I basically had to help people help themselves. We had, we had just... Um, we had to have a, them make a promise to pay and then we had to have them keep their promise and I'd uh, intense follow up. I also learned that people weren't necessarily eager to be contacted when they were late with their payments so I, I learned to call early and to call late and to use different phone numbers to call from and uh, that I could track them down when they go missing by uh, finding things that were interesting to them that they would, that would draw them out. So like I had a what? few little. Yeah. <laughs> well, because I was working for a car finance company in my second debt collection role, I knew some things. I knew their birthday, I knew their last known address, I knew their vehicle, their model year, uh, the color of the car, etc. So if they disappeared, we might ring up a friend or a referee and let them know that their. Um, their new fender had arrived or their new alloy wheel had arrived for their 
particular model. We'd say the model because it sounds good. I just wondered if, if we, uh, but we were waiting for them to come and pick it up at the shop, but we haven't heard back. And they quite often would reveal the contact details. Or well, sometimes we could ring up the uh, roads, roads registry, the traffic authority, and, and um, ask uh, them to update our address. And quite often the operator would reveal the, um, the new address to check if that's the address that we're living at. We knew the driver's license number and the, the, um, the registration. So I guess you could say we were fishing. We we're doing a fishing scheme, but in this case it was not really for evil. It was really just to, to help someone be a better person and to pay back what they were owing. Uh, so I didn't feel bad about it when I was uh, 19 years old. It was, kind of it was kind of enthralling to do. And then I got to repossess cars when people wouldn't make the payments. So I'd have to go out and visit them and uh, either get a payment or get the car. And wow. I repossessed over 100 cars, which was, um, I think was really good for my communication skills and my um, ability to work in difficult situations. Yeah. Do you get threatened? I mean, what, what do they do? I mean, you're going to take their car away. Yeah, I got threatened a lot. Uh, sometimes with knives and guns, but it's Jeez. not like America. Like we don't have 16 weapons sitting in our glove box uh, here. There's virtually no weapons uh, compared to the USA, for example. So little less likely to get shot or stabbed. Right. But you get good with words. So you um, you just talk about. You just say, "Hey, let's talk about this for a minute. Why are you so angry with me?" And they're like, "Well, you want to take my car?" And I'll say, "Well." why do we need to store your car? And they go, because I haven't made my payments. I say, well, so really what we're getting to here is that if there's anyone to be angry with, it's not really me. It, it should be with you because you've let yourself down by not making these payments. And what I'm here to do is to help you feel better about yourself. How can we come to an arrangement where you can make these payments and, uh, and straighten things up again? You know, so you, but that's just an example of one word track. I have to think on my feet fairly quickly when yes. someone's waving a knife at me <laughs> very quickly <laughs> yeah and i think i listened to some i don't know if you were doing a talk and you took your wife um on a date to repossess a car yeah is that true yeah it's true uh yep this guy was particularly difficult to to get a hold of and uh, i left a, a message at his mother's house and when when they rang to find out who'd left the message i knew that he was there so I, I, I uh, said, hey, let's go. Uh, we've got to go and pick up a car. It was like late at night, like probably 9.30. She must really love you. <laughs> it's kind of fun. Never, you know, it's, it's something you don't often do. No, definitely and, not. And as we approached the place, I kicked her out onto the curb with an umbrella because it was raining. And I said, just wait here. And I, um, I went and picked up the car with a tow truck and then picked her up again. And then as I'm driving home, the guy calls my mobile and starts swearing at all the, all the rude words you never really want to be hearing over loudspeaker, <laughs> and making all these threats and et cetera. And I, um, I responded to that and, and then hung up and, you know, mission completed. But it was an unusual date for sure. So did you get your thick skin from your grandfather? Where do you get this? <sighs> yeah, maybe it's... Maybe it's from, from uh, I'd say, good parenting. I had good parents and good grandparents, and, uh, and they set me up well, but also these jobs that I took on some very difficult jobs. One of them was laboring. I literally dug out someone's swimming pool in their backyard with a shovel. Wow. It took me a while. Oh, yeah. Uh, and a pick because they couldn't get a crane in here and they couldn't get a bobcat. It was just limited access, so it was done by hand. Uh, I think that toughened me up a bit. I know the value of hard work where you get calluses on your hand, where you, you're working till you can't do anything else. You just go home and sleep till the next day. And I did that, uh, you know, five days a week. For, yeah. Back then, it was like I was 18. It was $400 cash in the hand a week. Mm -hmm. in, and uh, it, was, it was tough work. So I, I always feel grateful when, when I don't have to get calluses on my hand to do a, a job. To I don't want to trade time for money anymore that's yeah. one of the biggest life lessons yeah no I, i'm glad you share that because people just see you and go oh you know they only see what they see right now in your business they don't see all that hard work in those jobs you went through and you also did car sales and cars car you know car sale management um what did you learn from that experience 
Well, I did it for so long, I learned a lot. How long did you do it for? From 1995 to seven years ago. So that was probably uh, 12 years. Yeah. Maybe it's 20 years. I can't remember. But anyway, maybe it's, maybe it's a long time, more than a decade. Yeah. It's a very tough industry. It's a male-dominated, 100-year-old industry with, with seven competitors within 30 minutes of where you're working. Uh, you have very aggressive buyers who have been educated by bad advertisers offering discounts and price and they try and turn it into a price game you try and turn it into a value game um, you learn everything in in selling cars because it's it's really like going to war uh, and i think those skills have carried across into my yeah. new business do you think everyone should uh get a job selling cars at some point i don't think so i, don't, I mean I'm just one person and my skill sets are going to be different to some other person. So yeah. someone might be a gifted artist or um, yeah. might be a rocket scientist. So no, I don't think so. But I, I think anyone who does do it will understand what I'm talking about. It's an extremely complex business. Yeah. That's selling, what my sister did. She sold cars for many years. Yeah. Yeah. And I bet she's pretty tough. <laughs> yeah. In a male dominant industry, she's pretty tough. We toughened her up. Yeah. Um, so when did you discover internet marketing? Well, I didn't even have a computer between 1996 and 2005. Uh, so I got a laptop in 2005 and I was just looking for a book to build my collection. I was looking for a Jay Abraham book and I got name squeezed by Rich Sheffren and Stephen Pierce and they tried to convert me into an affiliate like to sell or give away these reports and make money and it was all, it's all this new world. I couldn't work out why some words were bolded or italicized or highlighted with yellow. I didn't understand there was this concept of copywriting and I had never heard of affiliate marketing. I'd never heard of ClickBank. It was all this strange world and, and uh, I thought, you know what, maybe I should try and build a website and then I could give away these Jay Abraham reports and maybe I'd get rich. Uh, of course, I didn't sell one. <laughs> it took me nine months to learn how to build a website. Uh, so it was very slow progress in the beginning. So then what kept you going? Why, you know, after nine months, it's so slow. You don't sell any. Why keep going? What made you keep going? Well, I just reasoned that I'm, um, I'm a, of, of average or more intelligence. I have sales credentials and management experience. There's no reason... There's no logical reason why I can't figure it out. It's just a puzzle. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm extremely persistent uh, compared to most, I'd say. Yeah. Uh, and, and I wasn't going to let that be a dis dissuasion. I was just going to conquer it, even if it took me a while. And it did take me a while. And once I... And, and really, it's like starting anything, whether it's surfing or any sport or any, yeah. any business. Learning a new language, you're going to start off slow. You're going to go through this phase of crawling over broken glass and mm -hmm. that's the phase most people give up. They cry about it. They whinge about how sharp the glass is but the people who get past it are enjoying a rarefied atmosphere where they know the barrier to entry is going to keep most people out. Yeah. So what was a big turning point for you then? Caving in and buying a couple of ebooks and some software. So and I spent this grand total of like two or three hundred dollars, which seemed like an outrageous sum after nine months of not making any money. I like to build the money and then reinvest profits, but I in this case I had to outlay the money first, which I wasn't excited about. Uh, but it was a critical step because I read the ebooks, it filled in some gaps and the software that helped me build a website turned into my first successful affiliate campaign that I scaled up to six figures a year. Wow. So what were you selling? What was the affiliate campaign? Uh, it was software called XI Pro. And it was how to basically help people build a website. Yeah. And I remember it, yeah. Yeah, seven years ago, it was pretty good. Yeah. So then what? at what point were you thinking, I want to do this full time and quit my job? Well, I was, basically, there was a week where I moved house and at the same week I launched my first information product on the warrior forum as a warrior special mm -hmm. offer and 
I made a thousand dollars a day in sales, which was about what my wage was. And pretty, I pretty thought, good. You know what? I reckon, gosh, if I could string a few products together or focus on this without having this inconvenience of going somewhere else for 70 hours a week, I could probably make a go at this. Mm -hmm. But I knew that I would have to commit to constant innovation and always be on my feet uh, thinking about what's next because you can't rest when you go solo. Yeah. It's, up to, you know, it's up to you. There's no one going to scoop down like a magic hand of God and pick you up and give you everything, which a lot of people seem to think is going to happen for some reason. Mm -hmm. But there is no holy grail. Probably some of the best advice one of my mentors taught me. There is no holy grail. And so many people are looking for it, walking around in life with their umbilical cord in hand, ready to plug in to get nourishment from someone else. And those people are going to always be losers. Mm -hmm. So, James, what are some of your successful products uh, campaigns that were and why were they effective? Well, the first affiliate one was very effective because I just owned that space. I, I, I learned to complement rather than compete and I created an amazing bonus around that software that everyone wanted even if they already had the software. So mm -hmm. that, was, that was really hitting the spot, understanding who my customer was, what, what would solve their problem because I was that person and it was much easier for me to relate it and to tell a, a true story and to refine every skill set, you know, refine my sales copy, I refine my conversions, I refine my autoresponder news sequence, I refine my SEO, uh, I mean, every, I mean, built every single scrap of it from, every, designed every banner to, to, there was no one else, it was just me and I, and it was successful to the extent that I got up to around a pretty steady 10 grand a month from it, from one product, wow. from scratch. That's impressive. And, uh, it was uh, it was pretty successful then, but it's been shadowed by other achievements since. Um, one of my other best products was SEO Partner, was a SEO service that I built. Mm -hmm. In the beginning, I just had a couple of customers, and I was doing all the SEO. And then uh, I realised that you know I shouldn't be doing all this work, so I engaged in an Indian company after trialling three or four different suppliers. And they were doing some pretty good work, but I didn't have to do it, which was great. So I then realized that my customers at the time would probably also want to use it, so I white labeled it. And I built that up pretty quickly to about 650 grand a year wow. in revenue. But the margins weren't as good as I would have liked. So I, I actually, by this time, had started building my own team of, uh, in the Philippines, and I switched the work over to them which brought my margins into a more comfortable zone. Now I own the race course, I'd vertically integrated. Mm -hmm. I think that's the business term for it. And I had much better control of the quality and the supply and, yeah. and um, that went on to be a seven figure business and, yeah. it, and it really just started with, um, basically I replicated what I had in the car dealership. I now had a team and managers doing service work uh, and keeping a profit on top. and setting up support and, and marketing it at the front end and, and that's been a wonderful product. I mean, it's made, literally sold millions of dollars over the years. It's been going for, well, I'm guessing maybe five years now. It's, it's been a yeah, super product. That's remarkable. What have you uh, found? I have, Go ahead. I have other ones too, you know, like some of them, other ones that have done millions and, and some have been foundational because they... Um, they're what people know me for now. You know, I used to be like the Excite Pro guy and then, then I was an AdWords guy with double-digit CTR. Then I was a super affiliate. Uh, so it depends where someone knows me. But yeah. Some people know me as an SEO guy. Other people know me yeah. as, a, as a mastermind coach. But probably the, the single biggest impact has been on the race course because that was a done-for-you service. So I was charging people about $6,000 a month to do it for them. And then I rolled it into a master class where people paid a couple of thousand dollars to come to my house and I went through the whole s sequence with them. Then I turned it into a webinar for my paid community at Superfast Business. And then I made it an a info product for $79. And then I gave it away. And now there's been uh, around 14,000 people have accessed that course. Wow. And now I've turned it into uh, WordPress templates, which we sell every single day. So it's... It's like the product that keeps giving. I've used it in 
in several different iterations and it works in all of those iterations because it's such a, a worthwhile concept and it's it's something different than what other people have said you know there's there's stupid ideas out there like be everywhere which is like one of the dumbest concepts ever because that's like how to burn all your resource and have lack of focus whereas I'm saying look, the, the only thing you should focus on is having your own platform and let everything else serve that that's a really solid strategy so early on how did you get uh, your first customers <laughs> it's like parents at school uh, events like baseball while you're waiting there for hours till your kid has a turn to swing at a, at a ball three times and then walk back uh, you know I'd be, I was so enamored with this online thing and the leverage this idea you could put an Amazon affiliate link on your blog or um, that you could put an, a name capture and then build an email list and start marketing people I was just, just couldn't stop talking about it to all the parents and I'd literally go around to their house and walk through their computer screen with them to click on my affiliate link. Hmm, that's great. <laughs> you know, the first, the first affiliate sales were hard won, and and you know the, the funny thing, a minimum viable product or lean startups, you're going to hear them talking about the most successful apps, like like a, a restaurant app. The chef will actually go around to someone's house and go shopping with them and cook with them, and then go back and turn it into an app, like. Don't be afraid to roll up the sleeves and, and do excessive hard work in the beginning to prove a concept so that you yeah. can then hit the mark with the sweet spot when you actually build something. Yeah, yeah. And then you know their pain points and you know kind of how they act and interact. How, then what point do you start to scale it up um, and not go house to house? Well, as soon as possible. <laughs> I mean, for you, what, what did that look like? For me, it's really easy now. Like uh, the sales, marketing, profit podcast. Like a few weeks ago, I was having burritos at the surf shop with Taki, and uh, it's like, well, man, you've got all these successful students, and I've got all these successful students. Let's showcase them on a podcast because I think both of our audiences would like it. It's dealing with real stuff, not theory, yeah. and it'll feed our memberships. And he said, "Yeah, that's cool." So. A week later, I had the design, and two weeks later, we recorded, and and then within a day, we're number one in iTunes for business marketing in every ma major market. So, it's really a very quick turnaround. Now we have a list of hundreds, we have subscribers in the thousands, and we haven't even published episode three. Congrats, that's great. So, who is one of the success cases that would be good to share, and what did they do? Well, there's so many. Uh, but the first two we shared were really good. Uh, one was Taki's guy who, um, well, episode three is about a guy who was a chiropractor and then decided that it was trading time for money and he'd rather coach other chiropractors with all the things that he'd learned about running a successful practice. Mm -hmm. And within a couple of weeks, he had $19,000 in his bank account. And then a couple of weeks later, he had was thirty five grand or something using a webinar and a workshop. Wow. Another one, episode two, is about one of my customers, a designer, and he was um, basically doing wholesale design for local businesses in Melbourne, Australia, and working long hours and had in-house team and an office. Within a few months, he got rid of the office, went to part-time contractors, went to a global market, working in a different industry, and uh, he basically... He's like doubled or quadrupled his income and halved his time at work. So he's oh. very happy. Yeah. And showing no signs of flagging. Um, so what are some of the products and campaigns that didn't work as well as you thought? The one that, that's the done for you publishing has been one that's uh, uh, fascinated me. It's what everyone should be doing. But it's been a pretty tough one to market. I think I've tried it six mm -hmm. different ways and I've finally cracked it, but it's taken me about 18 months. And I think it's purely because the market isn't ready yet. I'm, I'm um, too far ahead of where the market's going on this one and mm -hmm. I think they'll catch up. I mean, the, the success of the Own the Race Course template has shown me very encouragingly that people are grasping the concept and now they need to step it up and be publishers mm -hmm. and and they shouldn't be doing it all themselves so I'm, some of my market are do-it-yourselfers at their own detriment they're yeah. doing everything that they shouldn't touch and then some of my market 
um, just haven't connected yet that this is what they need to do. They're still trying old tricks and, um, and I think they'll move eventually. It's just, it's working so well for me and my students won't be able to ignore it once you become aware of it. It's just the, I don't want to put too much effort into making people aware of it beyond yeah. what I'm doing now, which is like giving away the course, teaching people at a high level in my mastermind. And, and some of these people, when they, when they start doing what I'm teaching, they're pulling in $60,000 in the first few weeks. Um, they're taking their old broken information marketing business and turn it into a powerhouse with significantly less effort and significantly more uh, revenue coming in just by changing the way that they're approaching it. And, and you really can get a lot more from a lot less when you reformat or restructure things. Yeah. And what do you mean, so people who don't know, the done for you platform, what are you offering? Uh, basically, someone like you or, or me who podcasts or makes videos, mm -hmm. they should uh, either have the video or the podcast done or do it yourself. Fine. That's your highest value activity. You're an expert. You're a doctor. You're a star. But after this podcast or recording ends, that's where you should stop your activity. You should move on to the next one. Yeah. And what should happen is you just put it in a Dropbox and then someone else... Mm -hmm. And in, in this case, what we do as a, as a service is we take that video or podcast, we edit it, we publish it, we transcribe it, we illustrate it, we put, post it on the WordPress blog, we tag it, categorize it, give it a good title name and put it up there and in some cases we can even help syndicate that. Mm -hmm. And basically you go from having done the recording to it being live on your site within a day or so and you're now getting eyeballs and traffic to your site, but you didn't have to, to do that and you don't have to hire. This is where people try. They, they try and hire people on Odesk and Fiverr and, that, and they spend like 10 hours task sourcing a one-hour job and that's 10 hours they could have been recording. Right. In my case, I've got a bunch of people who can do this and they've been doing it for me for years yeah. and they're professional at it. So we just have recurring packages so you can have four podcasts or four videos per month for X amount and you can choose whether you want a full transcription or just show notes and either one is fine and it's just a set recurring and it'll cost you less than hiring one full-time person but you're accessing a team of four people who do their various parts yeah. quite well. And then the experts are doing it. You don't have to train train them. So no, not only that, I mean it's a service business. There's full recourse. So if you don't, if you're not happy with it, then you'd speak to me. I'm, an, I'm the owner of the business. I have pride. I have, um, I've trained these people yeah. within an inch of their life, so they're very competent. Whereas if you want to, if you want to bring in people, and unless your skill set is hiring and training and managing, yeah. which is something that I have got a skill set in, right. you, you're going to find it's more work than uh, reward to to do this on your own. Generally, yeah. I've found most people who hire two or three people, if they're not very good leaders, they're going to burn those people and they're going to be frustrated. It's better just to, to use a service and to make sure that you have a, a way to get a return on your investment, which is where part two is, having a product page with a packaging that makes sense. And that's where my recurring subscription business yeah. has been very strong. Yeah. And James, there is a big skill set to hiring and managing a team. What are some things that people should look out for when they are trying to hire or train staff because you have a, a large number of staff that work for you, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, like how do you for, bring someone on, like a new person onboarding? What does that process look like? So you have a very clear idea of the, the um, must-haves and desirables. You look for behavioral-based background. Um, you're hiring on attitude. If you're happy to train like I am, you don't need them to be able to do the thing that you want them to do. Mm -hmm. Unless they're a designer, uh, you can teach most other things. You can teach WordPress coding. You can teach. Mm -hmm. uh, you can even teach copywriting, believe it or not. Uh, it's, it's all trainable. I look for the attitude and I look for someone who's humble and who we can bring in and develop and they're appreciative and they have loyalty because of that. If you bring in an expert at the thing that you want, they might be good at it, but they'll probably disappear or have two jobs at the same time. So you have a very clear behavioral-based checklist. Mm -hmm. You have a several-stage interview process to weed out people who perform well in a random scenario. Mm -hmm. You have some tests. You uh, Once you hire, you have a full induction training. You give them a fair opportunity. 
you buddy them up with someone else who knows exactly every single task. So we have two people in our business who can do everything. Mm -hmm. So they just sidle up with that person. And then you have um, uh, reporting systems to, to keep tabs on them, whether, whether it's an activity report every day of what they did. Uh, we we, we uh, also have like temperature tests to see how they're going. Are they hot or cold and at the moment on work? Keep them stimulated, keep them rewarded, pay them early uh, and pay them well and you should have a good workforce. Yeah. How did you decide early on when to start hiring or how many people to hire? Because uh, you were doing a lot of it in the, in the beginning, right? What's that? Yeah, it was like 3 o'clock in the morning, feeling pretty worn out after a full day of work and a full right. night of work, yeah. uh, thinking that this is ridiculous. I'm a general manager by day with 70-something staff and at night I'm a solo practitioner trying to cobble together like five grand a month. Uh, I really need to hire a support person to handle all these requests for bonuses mm -hmm. and then I hired a content writer to write articles because I felt that I had a better calling than writing an article for e articles. Mm -hmm. So I can't type to start with. It's not my pure passion and it's not very leveraged. So once I scaled those two things, then I, then I realized that was good and then and it was probably another year or so later that I hired my first virtual assistant and my biggest concern was that I'd be able to keep them busy. Uh, and then I had another 60 after that. So I was, I was able to find 60 to wow. do. roughly. Yeah. Yeah. So I know like a big roadblock early on is limited time, cost of living. What's a, what's a challenge now for you now that you've grown so big? I don't really have any major challenges. Uh, my, my, my mentor told me to appreciate lack of drama. So I gear things around lack of drama. Mm hmm. With that many staff, how do you do that though? Isn't there drama there or no? Not really. Uh, I have a team of, basically there's a hierarchy. There's the top managers and then there's team leaders and then there's uh, the, the general staff. Mm -hmm. And the team leaders I meet with once a week, uh, today as it turns out, for about 15 minutes each and there's about six or seven of them. So it doesn't take too long. And then on the following day, I do a, a 15 minute meeting with all of them on GoTo Meeting, and we just share ideas from what we talked about today. So it's a once a week commitment for me. Mm -hmm. And then the rest of it's run by very solid reporting systems that come to me via email. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't really, and I've taught them all to think so they can make their own decisions and choices, and they're, mm -hmm. and they're self running managers. They're not mm -hmm. micromanaged, they're not robots, they're, um, they're intelligent human beings and they do a great job. Yeah. James, what's some software that you use to regulate the business that we, sh we should all be using also? Google Apps uh, for, for, for email. Mm -hmm. What's been a low point for you, a painful moment? <laughs> when I spoke in Dubai, the speaker before me uh, presented my slide deck which he ripped off from when we both spoke in London a month or so prior. Really? And I was and I was to speak after him. So I was pretty pissed off about that. Isn't your slide deck have like a sailboat and personal things on it though? It does now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Before it was more general. It'd be much harder for someone to rip off my slides now for, right. for two reasons. One is it's mostly just pictures from my personal life yeah. and two is it's never the same. I never present the same presentation ever. Yeah. Uh, so, and that's really why, because of that harsh lesson. Uh, you know, that slide deck that this guy ripped off sold 98, 99 from 380 people at a thousand pounds each in, in about 90 minutes. So wow. it was a really, it was a really good presentation. No, no wonder it got ripped off. But mm -hmm. it was just disappointing that there's some people out there who mm -hmm. stooped to that level. Yeah. So what did you do when you went on next? What did you talk about? Well, I changed my slides overnight and uh, I basically did what I always do in life when you get slapped down or when you get handed a lemon, just turn it into lemonade. Yeah. And uh, I think I learned that from my sailing. That's something you mightn't have known about. I used to be um, at World championship level in 18 foot skiff sailing yeah 
and when you are competing, there's so many elements. And you've got fitness, you have strategy, you've got equipment, you've got mother nature. You don't have the same conditions two days in a row. So um, you have gear failure, you have uh, some crazy charter yacht messing up the course, you have uh, technology innovations that an, another person might bring. Like in, in the year that we came second in the world titles, the only boat that beat us, there was only two boats with the with the previous shape hull, which was not allowed to be used again. They cost like three times as much. Hmm. They were on their last season and they were just that much faster. They, it was like Mercedes Benz in the Formula One at the moment. They're the fastest by a long shot and, the, and they come first and second in every race and then there's the rest of the pack. Right. Um, so we came first of the, of the normal class and second of all boats because uh, it was just a technology event. So you, you learn to deal with those frustrations and yeah. uh, you realize that the more things like that that pop up, the more you learn about yourself and the more it shapes your character and, it, mm -hmm. and it's not so much what happens to you but more about how you react with that and, and what you learn from it. So right. it's an investment in experience. Yeah. So I got an investment in experience on the fact that if you have something good, people are going to take it from you. That's pretty much what happens every single time. If you have a winning template, it's like own the race course. I got so sick of people contacting my own web team asking us to copy my site, I thought, yeah. you know what, I might as well just give them a copy of my site and right. I'll only charge them $299 for it and now we sell it every day. So I found out a way to win from my own success. Yeah, no, I like that. And um, James, so what's been a proud accomplishment? Looking back on your career at this point, what are you proud that you accomplished? Well, when, my, uh, when I was about 18 or 19, my parents lost all their money yeah. and I remember having to get a job and it was a bit of a slap in the face. So I, I suppose my proudest achievement is that my kids have not had to suffer the, lo the, uh, the, the scenario where their dad loses their job and all income mm -hmm. and have to sell that family home and car. So I haven't put them through that experience. Now, perhaps they're a little bit spoilt because of it, um, mm -hmm. but at the same time, I think it was an unpleasant experience that I wouldn't want to repeat. So I, I made a commitment to myself to provide for my family and I think I've done a very good job of that. Mm -hmm. And the, um, I did, you know, there was a moment when I quit my job and I was about to speak in an event and I realized I can't be sacked anymore. And I, I basically escaped the ring of fire that my dad had to jump through. And, mm -hmm. I, and I, that was definitely a an accomplishment to have yeah. made it all the way through my employment without being axed. It was like a race against time because I was in a luxury mm -hmm. segment. I was on the highest income possible and the market was getting the uh, US financial fallout. So yeah. I, I realized that this was a nasty ending coming my way unless I could jump yeah. quickly. Yeah. And you seem to do that throughout your whole career. You seem to reinvent yourself. Like people know you in different segments, the SEO guy or the, you know, whatever guy. What's next? What, what are you reinventing yourself? What, what's next on the horizon for you now? Wait till you see, Jeremy. It's a, it's a <laughs> secret. <laughs> the, uh, look, the real lesson there is about yeah. change. And I was fortunate yeah. to, uh, when I worked for Daimler Chrysler, uh, the Mercedes-Benz tragic merger, uh, one of the big management books was about managing change, managing corporate change. Sure. And if there's one thing you have to master, especially mm -hmm. online, it's the ability to change. Yeah. Don't get too fixed on your ideas or your, don't feel too comfortable in your position. Tomorrow your AdWords account could get stopped. Your Facebook account could right. get stopped. You could get a trademark letter infringement from a lawyer. Like shit happens. And if you can say, oh, well, I expected this. I'm going to move forward and, and this is like a Robert Ringer's positive mindset technique. Expect that stuff's going to go wrong and that you've got only a limited chance of success and if it goes better than that, then you're going to feel really good about it. And uh, to some extent, my, uh, my next stage will be an iteration of what it is now. Some things will go, some things will develop that will be new. They'll almost certainly be unexpected to the vast majority. Mm -hmm. because they won't see it until I present it. And if there's one theme, it's about simplifying. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So earlier this year, I rolled up about a dozen of my sites into one and I'm really just honing in on that and making it simpler. Like you said, usable and uh, more profitable, yeah. easier for me to understand, easier for the customer to understand. But, mm -hmm. but I'd say the, the biggest thing I'm working on right now is in my Silver Circle Mastermind. I have a master, um, a master plan unveiling that is going to be responsible for the success of more millionaires than, mm -hmm. than anything I've done before, I imagine, because I'm really getting distilled clarity on what it is that I'm doing for people that helps them the most and I'm going to just focus only on that. Yeah. So tell me that actually on the Silver Circle. What's something you discovered because you had the Silver Circle and you have so many students who are doing it that you wouldn't have known otherwise? Man, I learned so much. I work with 35 people every week on yeah. all sorts of businesses. So I've I really have a, uh, a feast of ideas and knowledge from that and the things I learn when when customers of mine deploy new campaigns and they talk about their industry, there's some commonalities. Like, very few of them scale up their support early enough. That's that's a common thread. Mm -hmm. You have to have a support desk if you're trying to run support from your inbox. You're not very professional, mm -hmm. and you can't scale. So that's mm -hmm. a big one. Uh, other things, uh, they're not spending enough money in their business. Uh, and it's, that's a really counterintuitive one, but a lot of people pride themselves with a 90% profit margin and, and to me that screams uh, solo practitioner unscalable. Mm -hmm. So you want to see what can you invest now to get a return on investment on and compound your business. Yeah. So there's a next, what you're saying is you're going to release a next level, which you can't reveal right now, of the silver circle. There's going to be some level that you're going to release um, that's related to that? It's going to be the same same level, the same program, but I'm mm -hmm. reorganizing the focus and the structure and the execution. I've, I've, I mean, I read a book every day, pretty much yeah. a business book, yeah. and I have a lot of time to think about... Uh, what's next and where I'm at and yeah. I've, I've got very good people around me to to um, listen to and to learn from so what happens is I develop ideas and I, I've got a very strong inspiration at the moment about what I would like to do mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm building it in the background and when it comes through I think it'll be uh, it'll be it'll be really good I think it'll be the next own the race course yeah uh, style product, but for my higher level customers, yeah. I'm not teaching it at a low level. It's yeah. too valuable, and it requires a substantial investment in yeah. in attention to get the results. But it's it's a basically it's like a it's like to to replicate the things that I've done in my business for people with with systemized help and support from me. Yeah, yeah. So James, I have two last questions. But first, I want you to tell people where can they find out more about you. Silver Circle, other other products, even if they want the high level ones or the free ones, where can they find you? Okay, so uh, superfastbusiness.com is the best place to to get the 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 big picture and the, the free courses yeah. and the podcasts yeah. for interviews and uh, join my community there. Mm -hmm. That's the seventy nine dollars per month, and I coach in there. And for people making six figures already or seven figures, silvercircle.com. Mm -hmm. So you can go straight to silvercircle.com, skip the free stuff and go right there. And so my last two last questions. One is obviously you've had a lot of mentors. Um, who are some when you first started and now that you follow or, or talk to? On usually, a my boss, usually my bosses. Uh, That's you though. Man. You're the boss. Well, I wasn't always the boss though. You know, when I was a salesperson, a sales manager, a general sales manager and a general manager, I had owners of the business mm -hmm. I was working with and I had bosses or um, corporate figures who went. Often they didn't know it and often they were teaching me what not to do. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so I uh, probably learnt, learnt the most things from one person in particular who was an absolute tyrant. I even created a whole information product about my experience with him called the lunatic millionaire and he was a big fan of general Patton, and uh, it was a pretty hard ass but the lessons translated across to my own business quite effectively mm -hmm. what about now 
Kindles. <laughs> Seriously, if you, you just buy a Kindle every now and then and read it and then implement, yeah. that's probably the best thing you could do for your business yeah. aside from joining my community. Yeah. I subscribe to Audible, so I listen to Audible every day. Yeah, whatever yeah. format works yeah. for you, uh, but uh, but it, you don't stop. That's the thing. You don't yeah. pull up. You never stop. I love a good book, and I, I like to pull out the ten to twenty lessons that are in it. Yeah. If you and, and my tip is, if you did nothing but just buy a Kindle and go through the highlighted bits in the yeah. highlight sections, you'll at least be able to skim the main points yeah. and dig in to learn more about those. Yeah. James, my last question, I really appreciate your time, is what's been the scariest surfing moment for you? I know you love to surf. Uh, and I know there are sharks in Australia. <laughs> yes, there are. <laughs> I don't know about scary. I've broken my ribs, but I wasn't scared. I was just annoyed at myself. Um, should never have the board bet sideways between you and the, the wave tip. Uh, I've caught a five foot wave uh, and I'm still relatively new and when you when you catch a five foot wave it looks like it's about 20 feet down so you drop into it like this and uh, sometimes if you fall off you can get sort of crunched around a bit like a washing machine oh yeah but yeah, you know, I, I don't think it's I don't think scare, scared or fear is really the right phrase more more, uh, you know, you learn a lot about yourself and your yeah. persistence and your frustration. Uh, so I've been frustrated at uh, how difficult it is, yeah. but also I've seen people do it, so I know it's possible and, yeah. and it's the same old story. And now I'm actually quite reasonable at it after just five months. Yeah. But in saying that, I've attacked it like, like seriously hardcore. I go once or twice a day and that means that Technically, I would have, I would have surfed hundreds of times now. Yeah, James, this has been super valuable. Everyone should check out superfastbusiness.com. James, it's been an absolute pleasure. When you're in the states in Chicago, let me know. I will do. I go most months, but not. To oh, Chicago. do you really? How often do you go to the states? Well, this year I've been. Uh, well, well, I went December, January, February, March. Wow. May. No, I basically go a lot. How long is the flight? 14 and a half hours to Los Angeles. Wow. And if you go to the east, it's another five or six, I suppose. Wow. You're a dedicated man. I love it. Well, it's, it's not like I've got much else to do. <laughs> well, I could be sleeping at home or I could be sleeping on the plane. So seven of it's asleep. The rest of it's movie time. It's really not that bad. Yeah. But I do have an advantage over people in Australia who don't want to travel um, to my benefit, right? Yeah, that's right. Thanks, James. I appreciate it. And uh, I look forward to meeting you in person someday. I hope so. Thanks. <laughs>